We are now joined by Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who made a return to our This Morning Sofa. It's good to have you back. Morning, Is it good Rishi. to be back? It's good to Rishi. be back. Thanks for having oh, me. Thank you for being here. Uh, obviously, we saw you at the Conservative Party conference. Um, but for me, it was your biggest hype team that I was interested in. <laughs> Uh, Akshata was absolutely incredible. She did a seven-minute speech. I mean, we can have a quick look at it because I think it's absolutely amazing. Have a look at this. The reason why I'm here is really quite simple. And it's because Rishi and I are each other's best friends. We're one team. There's been a lot about Rishi in the media. Now, some of it is accurate. I'm afraid he does love a good rom-com. And some of it is not so true. So you'll be relieved to hear that episodes of Emily in Paris are not informing his outlook on the EU. <laughs> and I hope you also know how proud you make our girls and me every single day. I mean, how lovely is that? And first of all, did you even know in advance that she was going to do something like that? No. So it was kept secret from me until very late on. So I only knew really very late on that she was doing anything. And the first time I heard her was when I was standing behind stage so were you ready to come how on. How did you feel before? Were you crying? How was well, you Well, yeah, it was, it was very lovely. But it was also just a, it was a big day for me. I was making yeah. a big speech. I was making these three big announcements on HS2 and smoking and changing our education system. So, you know, big moment for me to have her there to support me. And you sort of watching it, it was going, nice. How it was really nice before this? I went on. How much must have been? Yeah, for this? You're smashing <laughs> it out there. I was like, good, I can just call it a day now. And just <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, but no, it was, lovely lovely. To, it was lovely to have her there on what was... I was there doing some big things for the country and to have her there and give me a boost was lovely. Yeah. Well, let's yeah. talk about smoking and vaping because I think this um, idea to stop 14-year-olds ever buying cigarettes is such a, a fantastic idea. But on the other hand, you know, when you go into shops now, yeah. you're seeing constantly all these beautiful colours, different yeah. flavours, the vapes, children are trying it, um, you know, a lot of peer pressure in schools and things like that. Is there anything that you can do to even, like, eradicate these vapes, especially those single-use ones? Can you just yeah. eradicate? Can we not put that in, involved in the tobacco situation? We've got to get on top of this vaping. Would you agree? Yeah, completely. And I think we talked about this when I was last here, actually. I have two girls who are 10 and 12. You talk to any parent right now, any yeah. teacher at a school, and they will tell you how concerned they are about vaping. And the last numbers we had showed that one in five teenagers tried vaping earlier this year. And we've got to do something about it before it gets far worse. And so we're going to bring forward a, a range of measures, looking at all the things you just mentioned, Alison. You're right, because when you go into a shop, we don't treat vapes like cigarettes. No. There's lots of colourful advertising around it. They're right at the front of the counter, uh, exposed to I mean, to adults kids. are enticed to want to buy them. You can imagine yep. how children are enticed so right away. There's, sure. there's a range, so the range of things we're going to look at, so it's how they're marketed, the packaging, yeah. where they're displayed, and flavours, all these types of things, and disposable vapes, as you said, all of those are the things that we're going to look at, and we need to find a way to stop our kids vaping, whilst at the same time making sure that they are available for adults who are switching away from smoking. Because for someone who's a smoker today, vapes are definitely better for them. We want to make sure we preserve that, but we can't have our kids shake up vaping, not... and we need to be quite strict on that, and that's what we're going to do. Should that have been the priority, do you think, over cigarettes? In the... What struck me when you were talking was it's quite an inherently unconservative thing to do is tell people how they should be living their life. Look, we know that to cost the NHS £2.5 billion pounds a year. We know, we know that. We know that, that smoking's a bad thing. But I don't imagine... I mean, that's quite a risk for you to do that in a party that's traditionally small state, doesn't like to tell people how to live their lives. You worried about that backlash? So we're doing both. So we're going to tackle vaping and we're going to bring those measures forward in a couple of weeks' time, so you'll see that. But when it came to smoking, you're right, look, it was a big decision. Uh, it was a big decision for me to take, but I think it's the right one for the country, and that's what I'm about as Prime Minister. I want to change things, I want to do things differently, and ultimately do what I believe is right in the long term. Do you have to sit down when you make those decisions with your team and know that it's not... Because there are certain decisions yeah. that aren't going to be popular in your yeah. own party. Yep, I do. We have that conversation. And the exchequer. I mean, you make 10.4... We make 10.4 billion pounds out of the tobacco industry. Yeah, I mean, it costs our country 17 billion pounds. So, look, the cost of society is, is enormous. And you're right, we had those conversations, and I talked about that in my speech. I know not everyone's going to agree with me on this, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the easiest of decisions, but I think it's the right one, because it comes down to this. You know, smoking's different to everything else that we have. I think it's different to alcohol. Yeah, it is, because there's no, there's no safe level of smoking. 
it's just different to everything yeah. else. There's no safe level of smoking and it's highly addictive. It's a single leading preventable cause of death, yeah. disease, illness in our society. And if you think about this, I thought about it as a parent. I think any parent, even parents who smoke, if you ask them, do you want your kids to grow up to smoke? Obviously not, is the answer. But I feel and like I had really, a chance. And I think and we've I, all been I, touched by We've all been yeah. touched by cancer. We all know. It's one in, four, cancer, yeah, cancer, right? one in four cancer deaths caused oh. by smoking. And I, I had a chance as Prime Minister to do something about that. And so even if it's difficult, even if people are you know, not all going to agree, I thought it was the right thing to do. I'm looking at your speech and I'm thinking, all right, I get it. But then, like, we're going to be in a situation where a 34-year-old living with a 35-year-old, 34-year-old's not allowed to smoke, 35-year-old is allowed to smoke. So the 34-year-old just asked the 35-year-old for a cigarette. We're going to be in that sort of situation when you were 16, you were trying to get the kids, <laughs> the 18-year-old kids to go into yeah. the off-licence to get yeah. you food. Do you know what I mean? I sort of, yeah. So are you thinking by that point, yeah. society will be so... Exactly. That's transformed. That yeah. smoking that, 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 exactly. We want a whole generation to grow up without smoking, and I think it will transform society. And we know this has worked, because when we've done it in the past, when we took the smoking age up from 16 to 18, when difference. the US took their smoking age up from 18 to 21, it made a big difference. You yeah. see the smoking rates come way down. And I think if you have a whole generation who are growing up without being able to have bought <laughs> cigarettes, it will just change how we think about this. Sure. Change, Rishi, what's... And hopefully do something incredibly good yeah. for the country, for those people, but also for the NHS, mm -hmm. for whom it's one hospital admission every minute. You know, that's the pressure that it puts on the NHS, and we have a chance to do something about all of that, and I wanted to take it. What's amazing with tobacco is we know the effects of yeah. what it does. We don't know the effects of vaping. We don't know the long-term effects. And we are actually going to be launching a campaign here this morning, in January, uh, to kind of help young children not turn to vapes. And we want you to lend your support. Are you up for it? Definitely. You promise? Yeah, definitely. Okay, I'm going to hold you to you that. You can hold me to say, that. When you say that to Alison, that's a blood oath, right? No, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> Just made a blood oath. No, but, but I, think... Because, like, I think it's important, though, because, like, honestly... It really is. Um, yeah. When you go into these shops, honestly, they're making an absolute fortune. I really want you to crack down on the people who are selling them as well. So, that, and... you know, that's one of the things that we are going to do as well, because if what we need to do is crack down on these retailers who are selling them to kids, and mm -hmm. they shouldn't be. That's illegal today. And one of the things we're looking at is how can we give local authorities, trading standards, more powers yeah. to crack down on people who are right. illegally selling vapes to kids. But, look, you are absolutely right. I said I'd speak first and foremost as a parent of two young girls who are 10 and 12. You talk to any parent any teacher, yeah. they will tell you, we need to do something about this. Listen. And I think we all know the issues with packaging and flavours. We're going to do something about it. Good to have and you And I'll on come board. back and talk to you about I'm it. Very, Let's move on, because we haven't got Good. an awful lot of time. All right, come We've on. Get loads. Uh, HS2, uh, I know you probably, it's probably like the, the, the thing that's been ringing in your brain all week. The northern section of HS2 connecting Birmingham to Manchester has been cancelled. Um, what message does this send to the north of England? I mean, you've got... You're, you know, Lee Anderson mocking Bradford. You voted in favour of this twice. What's changed in your head? So, look, what's changed is a lot of things, right? The cost of this thing has doubled from when it was first greenlit. It's now going to cost over £100 billion. We've had a pandemic, which has totally changed how everyone travels, which damages the, the case for it, and it's going to take far longer to deliver than anyone thought. So, as a new Prime Minister, I came in and I wanted to look at this properly because it's a lot of money. £36 billion of your viewers' money, taxpayers' money. And I thought, is this the right way to spend that money? And I came to the conclusion it wasn't. Do you think it's just, it just the ads, the sums just wouldn't add up for you? Yeah, well, I, don't, you know... I, just, I think it's a better way to spend everyone's money is on the different forms of transport. So we're going to spend every penny that we would have spent on HS2, every penny of it, yeah. we're going to spend across the country, in the Midlands, in the North, hundreds of other projects, and more on the types of transport that the people use every day, improving roads, local rail, Buses, the bus fares are going to stay capped at £2 because of this decision that I've made. Yeah, that's the most popular form of public transportation. So, look, that was a decision I made. It's not an easy one, and as you can see, I've got lots of criticism from it, again, from people in my own party. But my job is to do what I think is right for the country in the long term, even if that's tricky, and that's what I'm about, and that's what this decision is about. It's is, about... It a, is it a financial decision? Is that when you sat down and certainly as Chancellor looked at the sums and... Like, you must have had an idea then. It's not about going. financial in the sense, because we're going to spend every penny that we would have spent on HS2, we're going to still spend. Well, our opposition parties is... are saying those plans are in place anyway. No, that's definitely not right, and I know because I'm in here. So we're going to take every money that we would have spent and we're going to spend it on hundreds of other local projects across the country. And right now, we're talking to councils everywhere about the extra money they're going to get, the types of projects they can fund that are going to make a difference to way more people far quicker. 
on the types of transport they use. But even you said, Dermot, for people in Manchester, remember, HS2 trains are still going to run to Manchester. The journey time from Manchester to London is still going to be cut by 30 minutes. But so we're going like, to get that benefit like the one thing and we've we're going to get all these other things. The one thing we've got is the one thing we didn't need, which was a high-speed rail link between London and Birmingham. That's not even guaranteed to, to end in central London. And I'm not putting that all on you, but it just says that... We, we can't do big projects in the UK. Well, so remember, we are, by building that first line, the entire journey time from Manchester to London is going to get cut by half an hour. It doesn't just benefit people living in the West Midlands. Even people living in Manchester are going to get a faster train time to London. But my point is, look, I don't think that's the right priority. So now I've got a choice about how do we spend £36 billion over the next sure. several years. I think it's better to spend it on hundreds of other projects in every part of our country that people are going to use more often and get that benefit quicker. Look, yeah. I know that's not an easy thing, but I 100% believe it's well, the right thing You've got to remember, Rishi, the there's country. people out there who sold their land, sold uh, generational um, farms that, that they sold on, and if they had known that it was never going to be built, they probably would never have sold it on to you. And, you know, people who have lost their houses had to move out. What would you say to those people there look, who have I, lost a lot? Yeah, I know there's been an enormous amount of disruption for people. Now, look, some people who have sold will have a chance to buy back. That will all now start happening, those processes. So there'll be many people who will yeah. be able to do that. But I, I have to look to the future. And I think the, the worst thing I could have done is say, look, there's a decision that I can make that I know is right for the future, but I'm not going to do it because mm. people will be upset or because we've already set, you know, yeah. we've already started off on the wrong track. I guess you get a moment where you, you either double down or you exactly. go, Exactly, you know, and I, look, I, I didn't want to just double down on something that I believe to be wrong. Okay. And that's fundamentally what this is about. Like, I'm, I'm in this job to do yeah. what I think is right in the long term, yeah. right? even if it's not easy in the short term. And I know that our kids and our grandkids we're going to have more jobs, more opportunity. It's going to be easier for families to get around. Our economy is going to be better off. People in every part of our country are going to benefit because we're going to take that money and do hundreds of other things with it. I just think yeah. that's the right thing to do. And I know it's not easy, but look, that's... When I talked in my speech, I talked about wanting to bring change to the country, do things differently, whether it's on smoking and vaping, whether it's on HS2, whether it's on changing our education system, whether it was on net zero, where I charted a new course that's going to save people five, Listen, ten thousand pounds. we've only got a couple of minutes left. Yeah, we've those are all talk... examples of me trying to do things different in this job to change the country well, for the better, can I even ask if it's you, not easy. I'm going to ask you, this is not going to be easy. Obviously, yeah. the doctors, they want 35%. Yeah. With all the strain, with strikes and things like that, why don't we just give them the 35% between you and me? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know what? We, we can't afford it and it wouldn't be right and it wouldn't be fair. Every it feels other... like everyone's so tired. They just want compromise now. They want everyone to, yeah. to, to sit so, around and actually talk it out. You know, I know it's frustrating. And I, look, I'll say this and everyone can make up their mind. Yeah. Every other part of the public sector has found an agreement with the government. Nurses, hospital porters, a million other NHS workers. You know how workers. important junior doctors are. Well, so are our nurses are really The engineering, important, right? right? So surely they're well, worth I sat, think, sat down I think, and look, chat. I think we have a process where we have independent bodies that recommend to government how much everyone should get their pay increase by. We accepted it in full for the junior doctors. You know what the pay rise was? It was 9%. And we cut their taxes on their pensions a little while ago as well. We accepted that. Everyone else in the public sector, including nurses, has accepted it and they're working. So, look, all I'd say is I think the government has been reasonable. It's accepted independent recommendations for a, a massive rise, 9%, mm. bigger than everybody yeah. else. Yep. And I think at that point, the government's done the reasonable thing on behalf of the taxpayers as well. We've got to get inflation down. I don't want to put your taxes up. I don't want yeah. to put your viewers' taxes up. I think it's reasonable that you know, the industrial action should come to a close, given that we've done the right thing. Now, look, yeah. if, we, if we'd said no and rejected those recommendations, if we'd given them a pay rise that just was lower than what was told, then fair enough. But we haven't. We've done what we were asked. We've asked. got one of our staff members, actually, whose father, a year ago, needed a triple bypass and he needed it quite urgently within 12 weeks. His heart was functioning on 27%. Uh, they then got the operation over a year later. I mean, what would you say to her who's watching this now and yeah. loads of other people who have been through that? Yeah, look, I, I know it's frustrating and that's why one of my five priorities is to bring waiting lists down. And, when, you know, we were making very good progress and we've improved performance in A&E and ambulance waiting times. We've put record money into the NHS. I care deeply about it. I come from an NHS family. Yeah. My dad was a doctor, my mum was a pharmacist. And so... I believe I'm doing the right thing. Weeks after I became Prime Minister, we put record money in. I came, when I was asked on this show, we were talking about how people can now choose on their NHS app where to get their treatment, because that will speed things yeah, up. Yeah. This winter, you'll be able to go to your pharmacist to get medicines for sore throats uh, and ear infections rather than seeing your GP. That's going to help people get yep. treatment quicker. And as Prime Minister, I did another thing that you talked about long term. 
I, I decided to have a long-term plan to train enough doctors and nurses here at home. So we're putting more money in, we're going to double the number of doctors and nurses we train. I'm not going to be around to see the benefits of that. It takes 15 years to train a consultant, but I thought that was the right thing to do for the country. No one else has done that in my job. No one else has said, let's put more money in now to train doctors and nurses so we have them for the future. I've done that, because again, it's the right long-term thing for the country. Before we let you go, we want to talk about immigration and multiculturalism. Yeah. Um, because this is something that me and Alison care both about. We're both children of immigrants, as are you. So when you hear your Home Secretary talk about the hurricane of mass migration, are you not embarrassed and ashamed when you hear words like that? Because, you know, me, it's the first time I met you, you seem like a decent guy. Three of us are evidence that multiculturalism does work. So, like, do, do you not scratch your head when you hear things like that? No, I think that this, this debate gets charged a lot with people focusing on things. So if you just take a step back, what do I think we all agree on? We all agree that Britain is an incredibly welcoming place. Right, we're all living proof of the fact that immigrants can come here, can do well, and that is something that we, I think, do better than any country so in the world. So we definitely haven't failed in any way, I would no, suggest. No, I think it's something we should be so proud of as Brits. It's something we do better than anyone else. But I think we also agree a couple of other things. When people do come here, they should integrate. They should sign up to British values so we have those shared understanding amongst us. That's really important, the integration piece. I think everyone agrees with mm -hmm. that. And I think we also all agree that it should be us who decides who comes here, not criminal gangs. Illegal migration isn't right, not least because people are being exploited and die when they make these crossings, but also because we're a compassionate country who wants to welcome people here, we're not going to be able to do that if our system is overloaded with people who have jumped the queue. And that's so why, that's that's why I want to be able like to stop the boat. Are you, not, so, are you not mortified when you hear words like hurricane? Because it's, yeah, it's, it's, that's not that's helpful That's destruction, language. that's like upheaval. It's I, not a good think, word to think, maybe use. I well, I think, look, there is... Well, I'm out and about, and I think your, your viewers probably feel that there is an enormous sense of frustration that there are tens of thousands of people who have come here illegally over the past few years. Years, and that's not right. And I think most people in their local community may now have a hotel that's been put over to house uh, illegal migrants. That's costing taxpayers it's five million pounds. It's weaponizing the word that worries me. No, we need, it's we making need those to people bring that to an end, right, and that's so, why we need to stop the boats. But it's weaponizing the word that worries me. It's it's it's, it's, it's demonizing the people that come here in the first place. That's the, that's my, like it's an issue. Of course it is. But it's how it's the incendiary use of that word that I think most people find unhelpful and harmful because it's not the people who are coming here's fault. Yeah, look, they are being exploited by criminal gangs, and that's why I've said it's got to be us. It's got to be the British people who decides who come who decide who comes to our country and not criminal gangs. They are exploiting vulnerable people. Many of them tragically die. That's not right. And, and again, it puts unsustainable pressure on our system, meaning we can't help the people we really want to. Now, look, I, I'm unapologetic about the fact that I want to stop the boats. We've passed new laws that will help us do that. We're making progress. Mm -hmm. And for everyone who cares about this issue, I just want to let them know, for the first time ever, the numbers are down this year. The number of people coming here illegally across the channel is down by a fifth because of all the different things I, I'm doing. And last, uh, yesterday I was at a European summit signing new deals with European leaders to work together. All of that is making a difference. In Europe, they've got this problem. In this year, the numbers in Europe are up, but we've managed to get them down in the UK because I'm working hard at fixing this problem. Well done. Well, quick five questions. This oh, is gosh. to show uh -oh. your kids how cool a dad you actually are. <laughs> uh -oh. OK, you ready? Oh, Barbie or Oppenheimer? Oh, I preferred Oppenheimer the film, but I love going to Barbie because I went as a family. Say, when did you get time to watch Oppenheimer? <laughs> I haven't had time to watch Oppenheimer. <laughs> yeah, I was long. It was long. Was it long? It was long. But we had a family outing to Barbie with my girls, which I haven't done in okay, ages. Quick, that was great. It's quick fire. Oh, I'm a celebrity or Big Brother. Oh, I grew up on uh, I grew up on Big Brother, but actually the Netflix. Beckham documentary right now. I've started oh, watching I that. I started. Is it oh, good? I saved it for after conference. It oh, is I'm getting involved absolutely today. brilliant. Um, Reli reliving my childhood is brilliant. Ta Taylor Swift, Britney Spears, quick fire. Taylor Swift, unless I'm on my uh, Peloton and my instructor there loves Britney Spears. <laughs> but otherwise, Taylor Swift. <laughs> uh, how would um, what would be your favourite Halloween costume? You know, actually, question. Oh, yeah, oh gosh. Uh, the first time Uxtha and I actually went to a party together, it was a Halloween party when we were in the States. Uh, she went as a girl guide and I went as Harry Potter. Love and it. And the big question we all want to know. The one on everyone's lips, are you watching Bake Off? Of course I'm watching Bake Off. <laughs> in all my, friend, in all my spare it. time. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so, so, so very, very much. Thank you, Rishi. Uh,